first of all, I just have to say, I am so proud of, uh, of all of you, uh, all three of you for, you know, putting together what must have been a dream book, you know. Um, I can only imagine the fun you had, but also the travails, you know, the trials and tribulations, of, you know, getting it together, pitching it, the, the whole editing process, um, because each, each and every one of you uh, really did a lot of research and put a lot of thought into these beautiful books. They're really, really special and, um, and surprising. You know, I've, I, I, you know, as an entertainment journalist, I think, you know, uh, uh, well, I can say, and I'm sure a lot of us can say, we've read a lot of these, these books, you know, like looks at, 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 you know, um, movies and TV shows through history and from a certain sort of angle and, and, um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, the celluloid, cell, celluloid closet is a seminal, you know, work of art in a way. Um, but, uh, and several, I think all of you could probably say that you were inspired by, uh, Vito Russo. Um, would, would you, uh, well, I'm just going to ju jump in here first and just introduce our, our panelists, our authors. Uh, we have Travell Anderson, who is the author of We See Each Other. Hello, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> A Black Trans Journey Through TV and Film. There we go. Uh, and then we have the equally delightful Kyle Turner with his uh, dry wit. There we go. That We have... Uh, the Queer Film Guide, 100 Great Movies That Tell LGBTQIA Plus Stories. There we go. And then Matt Baum. Hi, honey, I'm homo. And uh, sitcom specials and the queering of American culture. Now, before we start, I should say, what, what would you say are your pronouns, each of you? I'll go. I uh, use they them pronouns. I'm he him. And same for me. I just updated my thing. He him. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Travell, I love what you uh, you quoted uh, RuPaul as. Uh, well, I'm not going to uh, spoil it, I mean, or stomp on it. Uh, do you remember the quote in the book about uh, you can call me he, she, and you got what is that? You can call me he, she, or Kathy Lee as long as you're calling me. Is that is that one? Regis and Kathy Lee. Regis and Kathy Lee. <laughs> I remember reading that on RuPaul's website in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But just one That's of the a... nuggets in your book, Travel. Let's start with you. Um, so I have so many notes here, but uh, you know, first of all, I think our our viewers and our uh members that are attending i'm going to just look at the chat here to see as we get you know as we get questions and feel free to pipe in after we've sort of you know opened the door for that uh, uh to our members who are attending uh, now your journey is it, it's not just a, a look at uh, certain films that have inspired you and, and or that uh have bugged you it's your interaction with them and what you learned from them and how they actually helped inspire you or or uh come to grips with who you are um so um there are several quotes in in your book that, that uh, you know that you say at one point you you felt like you came across as an effeminate gay boy with a questionable sense of style <laughs> point and then uh, you describe yourself as a gender bending non binary trans woman. And so I'm wondering uh, what were the key movies uh, and shows that really, really did make you think? Um, in that yeah. Regard? Well, so I would say, I, I, I believe I said I was a non binary trans bad bitch, not trans woman. <laughs> um just you know slight little difference there yeah, and in um, that moment you, you, to <laughs> clarify you said in that moment um but i think for me so so one of the things i talk about in the book is this question um that we have all heard and we've all answered and we've all asked at this point of you know 
when was the first time you saw yourself represented in TV um, or on screen? Um, how I hate that question. Um, and how I hate the question because it, it you know, presupposes a particular like finality um, and, and binary in, in, in who we are and, and what we may need or look for from the images that we consume. Um, and so when I think of the images that I, that at one point in time, I felt, you know, represented who I was, the, the earliest one that I often mention is, is uh, Daryl Stevens and Noah's Ark. Um, being pivotal for me and my development at a particular time. Um, and then I also throw in um, two real life folks, Andre Leon Talley and Miss J Alexander, um, who both came into my life on America's Next Top Model. Um, so I talk about them at, um, in, in the book a little bit. Um, but in terms of the, the, the person that I am today, um, and feeling seen or being represented. I mentioned in the book how, you know, the character of uh, Uncle Clifford on P Valley um, right now uh, feels very um, specific to a lived experience that I'm, that I'm having now and how I show up and move through the world, um, particularly as a Black person from the South um, with, with, our very, you know, particulars um, right, in our right. lived experience. Um, and so that's kind of like a, a current example, but I also always note that like, you know, that character is played by Nico Anon quite fabulously, um, but he is a gay man. He does not identify as, as non-binary or um, with that uh, lived experience. Um, and so I'm always interested in, you know, what a non-binary person might have been able to breathe into that character um, as well. Um, that said, love Nico's portrayal um, and, and the care that he, he uses for her. Right. Well, maybe Nico will get the Dorian Award nomination. Who knows? Uh, well, that, wasn't, that wasn't a plug. Um, it but, was for uh, me. <laughs> okay. Duly noted. Well, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if any of us can say Oh, I, I saw myself on on the screen in that one role or the, that one person. I mean, I could say you know I identify with Mary Richards in some ways, you know. But but um, but when it comes to movies that sort of stirred the pot, you know, like uh, uh, Splendor in the Grass, uh, that that unrequited love, that like that the coming of age, like going, oh my God, bam, you know, it hits me like a ton of bricks. Uh, any movies like that? or TV shows or documentaries? I think for me, I give a lot of credit to the reality TV girls personally. Um, I feel like we don't, <laughs> we don't, when we think of, of trans visibility, most often we are, we're thinking of the scripted portrayals, right? We're thinking of a Lady Chablis in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, right? We're thinking of a, you know, uh, uh, Tangerine, Maya Taylor, Tiki Katana Rodriguez. Um, um, and we should think of, of those images, but we should also talk about, you know, uh, a pre-Orange is the New Black Laverne Cox, right? On right. I Wanna Work For Diddy. We should talk about Jayla Sims on Making His Band. We should talk about Isis King on America's Next Top Model, Laomi Maldonado on America's Best Dance Crew. Um, et cetera. Um, all all so, of this just, I just, you know, all of this points out what, uh, you know, the, the research and the depths and the things that you, you, you reminded me of. I forgot that Laverne Cox was on that reality show, you know, as mm -hmm. one of the wannabe assistants or something. I forget what that. Uh, Absolutely. She, she was competing to be uh, an assistant for Diddy, Sean Combs, whatever name he's going by now. I, you know, not to dismiss, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I identify as Diddy. Um, and so, it, so yeah, so I, I think of, of those projects, but for me, it's really the, the reality TV folks. And then I think in, when I think of films in particular, it's been coming to these images in adulthood, right? I didn't, I didn't see Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil when I was, you know, coming into myself. Right. I did not see I didn't see Paris is burning until I was in college. Right. Because, right. you know, my very particular southern background. <laughs> um, like he should know what I'm talking about. Um, and so so for me, a lot of the like more pivotal 
images that we think of when we think of, of queer representation on screen at, at large and specifically trans and non-binary, I came to in, in adulthood. And so I kind of have a, a different relationship to them um, than, than others. You said something very interesting about uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, how uh, it, that whole section is, is uh, particularly fascinating, uh, how you, again, it's like you, you say it better, but uh, how people and even the contestants, you know, maybe viewers, but definitely the contestants sort of, you, you see the sort of processing of, am I more than a drag queen? You know? Am yeah. I I mean, RuPaul's Drag Race, and there's another book that recently came out specifically about Drag Race um, that folks should check out. The name slips my mind, but Google it, you'll find it. Um, but in in my book, I I talk about Drag Race in the context of gender expansiveness on screen. Um, and so I talk about RuPaul as a figure, particularly in Black communities, even though RuPaul is not trans, right? RuPaul represented and represents a particular type of, of gender expansion for uh, Black folks. RuPaul was in a Spike Lee movie, right? Like, cut right. it out. Um, and, great, that was, that's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes in a movie. It's like, it's right. so great. That, um, and, but I talk about how drag race and drag, I think, has been for many uh, uh, trans people that we that we know about today publicly, you know, a a way for them to come into themselves. Um, in the last few years of Drag Race, especially, right, have shown us that. Um, but you can go you can go further into the the Drag Race history specifically. But then we can also have a conversation about Lady Shibley and Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. About uh, I I bring into that conversation also Tu Wong Fu as 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 a film, and I bring in Priscilla Queen of the Desert also into to that conversation. Um, and, and also their their reaction from critics. That, you know, you find some really and comments from the stars and, and like John Leguizamo, that very interesting, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, you know, we did a lot of research, you know, a lot of reading, <laughs> a lot of watching, um, but it really, the, the entire book is, it is, an, it is a history of trans images on screen from a particularly black lens. It's also part memoir, um, but it really is about, you know, gender expansion at, at large in, in society and in culture. Um, in particular ways, how it shows up for for Black folks. So I talk about Tyler Perry as Medea, um, and you know uh, Jamie Fox as you know Wanza, and Martin Lawrence as Shanene, and how those images I think also contribute ultimately to um, the types of violence that we as Black trans women and femmes are experiencing in our community. So you know we hit on a lot of things. Yeah, okay, and, and, and we and, see and, each other. Right, and you start with, uh, oh, it, you know, uh, women uh, undercover as men in the Civil War, et cetera, historical figures, uh, Georgia Black, uh, you know, Christine uh, Jorgensen. Uh, it's a really interesting, it sort of sets the scene. And uh, yeah, you know, speaking of uh, just a little history here, um, uh, personal history of yours, your grandmother ran a church out of uh, her house? Yes. Uh, my grandmother, her name was uh, Dorothy Montgomery Holmes. She was a Black woman, raised, born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. And she started a church in her living room. She did that because the church in which she came into her calling would not let women into the pulpit. Um, and so she started her own church with only her kids, seven or eight kids. I never remember exactly how many of them it is, uh, <laughs> but they were her first parishioners. And then she grew it into um, a, a broader church. And I talk about her specifically and how, you know, I feel like I learned a lot about gender um, in church um, and how that connected to my particular relationship uh, to Tyler Perry's Medea. Um, and, you know, we, we go from there and delve into how that relationship has played into, you know, my own uh, unfolding and, and, and becoming um, as well. Um, so you get, a, you get a little bit of, you know, you get a lot of film history and criticism and all of that, but you also get to know a little, a little bit about well, I, I love that your 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 grandmother introduced you to to, to Medea basically on an old VHS uh, or yeah. a DVD. 
It was oh, I think we were DVDs at that point. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, but I, I was alive myself. during VHS. Okay, you know I'm not as young as I look. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yes, it was a, it was a DVD, a bootleg DVD that we bought from under the highway from the DVD man um because that's they were always men for some reason um <laughs> Clark he should know again um and so I talk about how that kind of being a you know a catalyst right um in so many different ways and then now you know my complex feelings about Medea as a character today um and how that shows up in in trans related conversations as well right well yeah Travell yeah it, it it is definitely come uh uh, complex and uh, very interesting and edifying and fun and uh, you know perceptive. Uh, all those. Big I like to tell words. people that I, I wrote it like I talk, um, and so you know you 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 know so and I I narrated the audio book as well. If you really want to hear me, give it to you. Um, but I do that as a means of just saying that like a lot of times, right when we read some of these types of texts. It can be very heady and academic and like, you know, uh, not digestible. Um, and so it was important for me to write it like I speak um, yeah. so that y'all could receive it how I want you to receive it. Right. And and all three of you are very, uh, very similar, you know, accessible, uh, edifying, entertaining, interesting, uh, makes, you know, you want to go to the, you know, uh, Amazon and you know get you know stream stuff uh, or Netflix or maybe not Netflix since of what you say about girl and uh, Dave Chappelle. Anyway, um, so what's uh, uh, before we head to uh, we we'll talk to Kyle a little bit of course as well and then Matt. Um, I didn't know that Cary Grant was in a movie called uh, I've heard of the movie but I didn't know that he basically was a his you know pre some like it hot was a cross dresser. Uh, because he wanted to get out of the army or something or or I I didn't yes. see it. that is the 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 premise of the movie was they wanted to this is part of this is brought up in the section of the book in which I talk about um how a lot of the earliest characters that showed some sort of gender transgression on screen were men dressing up as women as a means of like deception um and like you know accessing something um, just so that they could take it off, you know, at, by, by the end. Um, and so there's this film in which Harry Grant uh, is in the military, but is trying to get back to the state. And so attempt, dresses up as, as a woman um, in an attempt to, you know, get access. I don't, you know, <laughs> these, <laughs> these movies from back me, in the like day. The that's been, you know, bosom buddies are like, you know, on, uh, you know, in a different way, the gay deceivers. Uh, yeah, sixties movie. A, a straight guy pretends to be gay, so he gets out of Vietnam. Um, and uh, so, Psycho, uh, Boys Don't Cry, all the way to Tangerine, and uh, and uh, Saturday Church, and movies that you recommend uh, at the end of you know each chapter. Uh, I'm going to uh, butcher this. Kuwano Hina. Mm -hmm. That was good. You was you was close. You was okay. Close. You was Take me to Hawaii. Um, uh, I, at the end of every chapter, John is talking about, I have these viewing guides at the end of every chapter, um, which are basically a collection of some of the films and shows that I spoke about in the preceding chapter, but also other pieces of, of content that I think you should engage with, whether it's YouTube videos, whether it's, you know, a podcast or, you know, whatever um, that might, you know, allow folks to, if they're interested and hopefully they're interested, take their education and their, their grappling with the, the work and the art and the content a little further. Um, I've been telling people that, you know, this is a book where you got to do some work because I don't explain a lot of things. And so if you don't understand, Google it, you know, you, you're going to have to put in some effort um, and that's okay. You should want to put in effort. And I'm particularly talking to, you know, the, the cis people who might be consuming this particular narrative. You should want to put in some work and some effort to learn the information that you need to know to be able to show up for us in the ways that you say you want to show up for us. Right. Um, and so, it, it, yeah. This should be in, you know, uh, uh, sent to Ron DeSantis uh, promptly. Um, you know, I, not I've you trying to get me banned. Not you trying to get my book banned, John. Come on, John. 
I would love to see all the networks do a town forum, you know, like they would do like a presidential, you know, uh, you know, in a simultaneous uh, broadcast, uh, a town forum with with uh, and you know, intelligent people that can explain accessibly what is what the deal is, so that everybody can just calm down. Anyway, that's one of my dreams. Um, Okay, well, Travel, that was just uh, so much fun. Uh, you recommend yeah. sort of. Yeah, just just briefly, can you tell me why you recommend sort of? Oh, sort of is a fabulous, fabulous show um, uh, created by and starring Bilal Baig, I think is how you say their last name. Um, and it, it's a it's a Canadian show that basically follow it. I love the show because it allows this non-binary character to exist beyond their non-binariness. Um, it does not ignore it by any particular means, but you know, they're a nanny and also a bartender and also have this, you know, lesbian friend who is, you know, multi-racial, multi biracial. She got a lot going on over there. Um, but it's such a really, for those of you who've seen it, it's just a, a really easy, nice, great watch. Um, and I think it's representative of the type of storytelling that we say we want as a community um, that allows our characters, queer characters, um, trans characters to, to be more than, you know, those particular slices of their identities. Um, and so I really love that show. Right. It's nice that it was renewed and uh, you know, maybe more people will, uh, more, more eyes will get on it this coming season. Um, or is it on right now? I forget. Anyway, uh, Kyle, why don't you say hello? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here with, with Matt and Travel, whose work I've admired for a very long time. Both, both of whose work I've admired for a long time, so I'm happy to be here. Well, you're both long uh, longtime Gallica members. Uh, I should just, uh, you know, again, this, this book is, is beautiful. It is very artistic. I mean, you know, the, the illustrations, I thought it said illustrations by Andy Warhol, but no, it's Andy <laughs> Warhol. Um, but uh, a little less but, pop art. And, and, um, but it, I, I'm really appreciative of the gorgeous work that Andy Warren did. Um, and it feels very special to have it out in the world and, and to have someone sort of take these movies that I love and, and um, have been very formative for me and uh, distill them into like a pure essence as opposed to just like a, not that there's anything wrong with it, but as opposed to a, a, just like a screenshot from the film, but like a, an interpretation. No, it, yeah, it's, it's great. And uh, each film gets two pages and with a, uh, a, a sort of a stunning graphic and a very, um, not too short, not too long for, you know, people that are in a hurry. <laughs> uh, look- Sounds like and... my last date. <laughs> Four stars. Uh, yeah, succinct, pithy, uh, interesting, and uh, you know, a really good sense for what each film, why you like it, why it's in here. Uh, and it's a hundred films. It, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's like a coffee table book in a way, like a small coffee table book, something that guests would just love to, to go, oh, this is interesting. Like Wild Reads. I just opened up uh, the page to Wild Reads. Uh, Andre uh, Teixeney. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love during the Algerian War, um, people dealing with the sort of the limits of their the politics that they claim they have versus what how, what they're actually willing to be committed to, and how that um, ends up shaping the interpersonal relationships and their their understanding of desire. And I'm sure that lots of us have have um, had conversations where um, uh, people claim to have certain politics and that. Uh, and and as to whether they actually show up and whether they commit to that kind of praxis, it, it shapes how we engage with them and how we um, see them in our lives and the roles that they have in our lives. Yeah, uh, super relevant without, without sounding uh, trite, but I, do, I love that film. And it's so, uh, it's, uh, your selection is extremely thoughtful as well. It, it's, it's uh, you know, it's like, oh, sure, that one, but there's a lot of, um, you know, and sort of, uh, of course, queer Sinise will be, you know, thrilled with with your selections too. But there's there's you know uh, unusual ones like the the killing of Sister George that you know wasn't considered a, a great when it was released, but uh, but has come to become sort of a, a 
you know, appreciated cult classic in a way. Great opening credits, by the way. Um, so, uh, and so, yeah, tell me a little bit about the killing of Sister George. Why you put that in there? Um, I I confess that I love a kind of a problematic queer. Um, I, I, I'm really into sort of the heightened nature of, uh, and I understand that this is with the privilege of, of being able to look back retro retrospectively, um, but The Kingdom of Sister George is uh, about this soap opera star who um, it realizes that she's about to be killed off of the soap opera that she stars on. And it uh, she's already an alcoholic and kind of abusive to her girlfriend. Um, but there's this like dry irony to it um, and the way that these two people interact with one another, um, it's as if they're play acting some of their like their most taboo desires as far as the discrepancy in age, the discrepancy in power. And uh, it is not unlike something like the piano teacher like uh, by Mikhail Hanukkah, where you're trying to distinguish who exactly has the power, whether it's this person who is um, performing as dominant or whether it's the person who's actually performing as more submissive. Um, and the fact that that film was released in, I believe, 1968, um, it was willing to engage with those ideas, particularly within a lesbian context, um, I thought was really interesting and, um, and regardless of whether some of the subject matter or, or its uh, depiction may be um, uh, complicated or uh, loaded, I think it's still an important way, I think it's still important to understand how it exists within a broader context and lineage of queer cinema, especially as it was being produced by the studio, because it was directed by Robert Aldrich, who also um, did whatever happened to Baby Jane, and so he has this. Uh, he has an awareness for the sort of the um, excess and irony that can be conveyed through uh, performance and through queerness. So I, I was very interested in including that one as well. Yeah, that's really well said. That's interesting about uh, uh, the tone at that a little bit of I don't, not I don't know irony. It's just some some wit, like a, a, a subtext of like. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to describe. Um, you have Brokeback Mountain and A Single Man, which was, I, I believe, our first um, film of the year, Dorian Award winner. Um, and then uh, Weekend, which was also one of our winners. Uh, it won several of uh, several Dorian Awards. Um, and Appropriate Behavior, Carol, another winner, Tangerine, another winner, Spa Night, Moonlight, another winner. These are uh, more recent films and up to Fire Island. Uh, but you also start with uh, a, a film from 1919? Mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. about that. Um, I start off with Different from the Others from 1919. Um, which was made during the Weimar uh, period of Berlin. Um, it was originally intended as somewhat of a PSA docudrama um, that was made in uh, collaboration with Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, um, who was a sexologist and was uh, studying um, the quote unquote a third sex, which is to say homosexuals, um, queer people. He was also interested in uh, transgender people. Um, and uh, this is the earliest surviving example of a feature length film that portrayed queerness with um, empathy and sympathy. Only 50 minutes of the film survive and it was reconstructed by the UCLA Legacy Project, uh, Outfest Legacy Project, I believe. That's and what's really, uh, what's really stunning is that it's fully formed. Like uh, the film industry um, in, in Europe and, and in the United States was still like sort of, in its infancy, even though it was, uh, even though they had figured out how to churn out in, through a factory method of uh, how to make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies. And at the time uh, in Germany, this film and the films like it were specifically made um, to educate others in, uh, in Germany um, because of the penal code that uh, criminalized homosexuality. So I thought that beginning there where there's, um, even though a very, uh, a very crude, so to speak, or a very a simple version of what sympathy could look like 
and and what humanity could look like for queer people on screen. I thought that was a good starting point to show that like queer people have basically always have existed for as long as cinema itself has existed. In the introduction, I mentioned that like one of the very first images of queer people is in the, is the Dixon sound uh, f film sound experiment, um, which was like 1895, I believe. Um, and I I want to show like the the scope of what queer people can look like in film, not just that it's these recent examples of, of Fire Island or Moonlight or, and what have you, but that there have been, that there's like, that queer people's existence is inextricable with uh, creative expression in general. Right, it's been, it's been there and filmmakers have captured it. Uh, uh, filmmakers tend to be a little bit um, creative and observant. <laughs> I hope. Um, Not me. So, I uh, need glasses. Right. right join the so. club. Uh, different from the others is the name of, of that 1919 uh, German film. You also mentioned, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, much in, in uniform. I've known it, but Sylvia Scarlet. That sounds fascinating. Sylvia right. Scarlet George with Cuc directed, directed by, by George Cukor. Love um, the. Uh, he used to throw these like grand parties in in Hollywood, full of twinks um but uh sylvia scarlet was felt kind of like an in joke um between george cooper Cary grant and katherine hepburn um because they all had this like glass closet experience where they were kind of out to their friends and out to the other pe peers in the industry but um those watching at home um those who went to the movies weren't aware of the way that they were playing with their gender playing with how they approach desire, playing with their different, uh, uh, exploring different kinds of relationships. Um, Carrie uh, Grant, well known for having a, a long term um, significant other roommate, uh, Randolph Scott. Um, Catherine Hepburn was involved with relationships with women for a long time. Um, there were uh, uh, George, uh, uh, George Cukor um, found um, Catherine Hepburn in an audition, was initially not impressed with the role that she was auditioning for, but knew that there was something about her and then started working with her, started working with Cary Grant. And together they have this ball of um, gender play, basically, where um, Sylvia Scarlet, uh, uh, where um, Catherine Hepburn's character has to don this disguise um, to escape the creditors that are after her father. Um, and in the midst of this, she has men and women falling in love with her left, right, and center. And um, they don't question it, really. And throughout the film, um, even as there is a, the reveal towards the end, um, it doesn't really change the status of how well-liked and how desirable Catherine Hepburn is, regardless of the um, wardrobe or the presentation or the, the gender that she's performing. Huh. Sort of like Victor Victoria in a way, sort of. Yeah. Um, but uh, wow. Uh, what what movie is your favorite of these 100? I, sorry to throw that to you, but I'm sure you've been thinking about it. Yeah. Um, the answer that I've been giving lately uh, is Cruising, the William Friedkin film from 1980 with Al Pacino, really? where he plays a cop that goes undercover. Hmm. Um, into New York's BDSM leather scene. And I know that it is a controversial pick, but I, I like to describe it to uh, people who have not seen it as um, cruising is homophobic, but in the best way possible. And that it's, it, it is coming at a, a pretty um, it, a bad time insofar as the New York Anti-Violence Project was created in 1978, 79 to address the very real problems of anti-queer violence. And William Friedkin feels sort of like he's rubbernecking uh, as at this community, even though um, in 1970 he directed a play, uh, he directed a film adaptation of Mark Carley's The Boys in the Band. Um, and he tries to like um, engage with this community in good faith, but as a stranger of identifying director, there are obviously limitations. But what's fascinating to me is not only it's sort of like archival perspective about um, queer buyers in New York, like the Anvil um, and the Ramrod and all these different um, clubs and bars uh, that no longer exist in New York and were predominantly in the meatpacking district as well. Um, but also the fact that he's using these spaces as a way to contextualize and interrogate the racial dynamics within them. Um, hmm. 
for the way that the sequences are set up are such that like Al Pacino is in these in like a regular leather bar and the camera is panning back and forth examining and and looking sort of um zoo like at these different people and then the next sequence is him at another bar where it's all these people dressed in cop uniforms all these people dressed in police uniforms <laughs> and then the final uh, the final sequence in the bar in a bar has like the uh these patrons wearing leather jackets leather caps with um an eagle on them and all this iconography of fascism of the police state and even though it's like kind of a dicey metaphor to make i think it's really interesting that william freaking was um bold enough to make this connection between the way that the uh, the united states at the time was in very pre uh, very koch era pre giuliani era new york making this connection between the way that uh, the united states would would fetishize um, the police state and state surveillance and state sanctioned violence um, and connect that with the way that queer people could be complicit in that ascension. Um, the way that he does this is by um, examining the way that certain queer communities do eroticize the aesthetics of fascism. Um, in this essay, Fascinating Fascism <laughs> by Susan Sontag, um, she talks about how sexual adventurism is signaled by like leather caps, boots, meat hooks, swastikas. And you see that in the movie. And I think it's something that goes unaddressed within gay communities quite often. And that like a lot of the imagery that we use is rooted in white supremacy. And well, there's S and M, you know, to, uh, you know, that you know, who you know, that that's a whole book right there. I think you guys yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so I, um, I think cruising, even though it was protested upon release. It's it's still controversial. It's received a little bit of a little uh, of a critical reevaluation in the last decade or so. But I think it's a really fascinating object, and I think instrumental to understanding some of the ills that exist within the queer community with regards to um, racism and gotcha. Now you know it's and tribalism. It's funny because uh, not funny, but it's in, Travel mentioned uh, Silence of the Lambs has has some younger uh, trans folk who are actually have found that movie to be uh, meaningful. And, and so, uh, you know, different takes for different uh, folks. Uh, now, uh, thank you, Kyle. We're going to uh, pop on over to say hi to, to uh, Matt. Matt, are you there? <laughs> yes, indeed. Hello. Thanks for getting this all together. You know, what I'd like to do is uh, after we uh, talk about your book, which uh, again is just uh, just uh, really great um i uh, learned so much uh it was very it's very interesting I, I was up late last night um with all three books uh uh i would love for if if the authors have a question for each other one question for each other and then we'll open it up to uh questions from the group um and uh but let's talk with now speaking of societal change and um you know uh images that's or, or creative people in hollywood that try to capture what's happening but can't really do that you know like blatantly uh bewitched uh did you i mean we you know we all know that uh paul lind uh was gay not a happy gay guy uh a bit of a drinker and and embittered for whatever reason um and uh, that dick Sargent was closeted until he wasn't um but you bring up how fascinating fascinatingly how like elizabeth Gum montgomery said yes we were the whole show in many ways was an allegory for um lgbtq people and other you know people that were uh for, for the underrepresented yeah, it's true. Um, she was really clear about the show, how important it was for her that Bewitched be something, a show that could speak to folks from various marginalized communities. And it's really lovely because you can enjoy that show just because there's silly, goofy witchcraft stuff happening, which is certainly how I enjoyed it uh, on Nick at Night when I was young. Um, but then when you go back to it, you can really see, oh, this might, could speak to interracial marriages or mixed faith marriages, people with disabilities, you know, immigrants. There's so many different um, groups that might feel like outsiders, uh, 
who in the middle of all this laughing could also be like, huh, you know what? They're actually <laughs> they're making a good point. Right, and the, like the fight for civil rights and how uh, Andorra or Sam would, you know, say, uh, you know, like uh, that's a stereotype of witches. Isn't you know? it amazing? Yeah, in the 19, or mid 1960s, 1964, they're explicitly talking about the harm of stereotypes. And they're doing it through this very silly metaphor of, oh, the stereotypical witches. But, you know, she's saying very, here's a character, you're, you're essentially a POV sympathy character who says, don't you understand when we see images like that, it hurts. Amazing. Uh, witches being, about... uh, of, of, of stereo, like witches, yeah. like, you know, killing people that like, wh what are the images that she's, she's, she actually says, I'm offended or I find that offensive. Yeah, that's offensive. She, well, she's talking about like the blacked out teeth and the green skin and the pointy hats and the broomsticks. And, uh, you know, and, and then we see in contrast, we see what the witches are like. And, you know, it's Retta Shaw and these lovely women who you just love to have some tea with and do some knitting. Um, so it, it really provokes, I think, the audience to think like, oh yeah, there, there are a lot of stereotypes out there. And what we say about people or what the, what Darren says, Darren represents, you know, the common man of the 1960s. And he says like, that's just what people think. What's the harm? Well, goodness gracious, uh, there are a lot of people making noise like that about actual real life groups at the time. And if television is still cautious enough that it can't really talk about that openly on primetime, on Bewitch, on a family show, um, I mean, this is as close as television could get. Right, and, and you talk about also a fantasy sequence where, uh, or uh, it's a, some like a magical fa uh, fantasy yeah, a, a dream. Where, where people are uh, carrying uh, protest signs. Yeah, the witches are incensed about these negative depictions and there's a candy company executive that wants to advertise around Halloween by showing ugly witches. And so the witches, again, like just the sweetest ladies, um, they get protest signs that say, we demand a new image, witches are people too, uh, unfair to witches. And they invade the candy company executive's dreams and bother him until he understands. And they also do this, um, interesting thing where they show him how he would look as a witch and he realized, oh, you know, it's unpleasant to be depicted in this unrealistic way, to be represented this way, uh, and changes his mind. And this is a very like, you know, 20 minute pat satisfying, <laughs> all of our problems have been solved in the span of a, one, one and a half scenes sure, solution. Sure. The civil rights era took, <laughs> has taken uh, longer to reach this point, but, um, it looks exactly like the real life protests that were going on at the time for a variety of causes. But also this episode aired just like a few weeks after what is regarded as the first public protest for homosexuality. You know, it's fascinating. It's, it, the, and the series ran for, what was it, eight years? I forget, you know, it's, and, and it was yep. pretty subversive and it's, you know, like uh, uh, Samantha was a pretty hip, um, uh, you know, uh, figure. She was the... As you said, the, the, the you know our 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 point our, our point person our avatar, mm -hmm. and um, I remember as a kid, you know, just thinking, you know, like she's so cool and she would love everybody, um, and it turns out I think Elizabeth Montgomery was very much that way herself. Okay. Um, the uh, so you in your what made you decide you wanted to write uh, Hi, honey, I'm a homo. Well, the short answer is just, I love television and I just like watching TV. And in particular, I like sitcoms because those characters feel like our friends. You know, when I'm watching the Golden Girls, I just feel like I'm hanging out with people I love to spend time with, uh, even though they're not real. But um, there's something about that relationship, the power social to get like kind of, you know, academic about it, but something about that relationship where we feel like we know somebody even though we don't and they may not even be a real person. Um, but also in the process of just, loving television, there are these little glimmers that I saw of how TV tells the story of what's going on in real life. And in particular, it tells a story that I'm very familiar with of the multi-decade project of queer liberation. Um, I have worked in the entertainment industry at Lucasfilm and Jim Henson Company and some other companies, mainly in archives. And then I also worked in what you would call gay ink. Uh, I was part of the Supreme Court lawsuit over marriage equality. And so, you know, I've had these two different lives of entertainment and politics. And the longer I spent in those worlds, the more I was like, oh no, this is the same. These are two 
these are the same industry. Entertainment is political and politics has to be entertaining. Um, and so the, the- Let's not make it too entertaining though. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just I, thinking Trump anyway, but moving on, that's a totally different thing. So now um, you also, uh, in, in, in going back through history and looking at uh, shows that sort of uh, were seminal in depicting LGBTQ characters, uh, what, what did you no, and what did you not know? Like, well, the, the latter question, what did you not know? What are some huge nuggets that you're like, I had no idea. I mean, did you, when you watch Bewitches as, as a kid and reruns, were you like, oh, this is like a gay, uh, you know, uh, analogy in some way or, yeah. or not? I, I would say I was really stunned that the Bewitched episode goes as far as to say the witches are out. That's the title of the episode. And one of the characters says, come out and tell people who we are. I, I mean, just how close they tiptoed up to the subtext. Um, a, lo a lot of what I discovered was the behind the scenesy stuff. So I knew about the gay history and I knew about the, the episodes themselves generally. You know, there's there are some that I discovered like Barney Miller, I'd never seen until um, I started working, uh, until I made a video about it for my YouTube channel. Because uh, Barney Miller just wasn't in syndication where I grew up. It wasn't on Nick at Night, so I missed it. But a lot of what I discovered was all the stuff that went into the making of these episodes, especially when you get into the 70s. And finally, thanks to Norman Lear, among other people, TV can be a lot more frank. So um, it can be, but not everybody wants it to be. So I learned a lot about the fights with the censors and the forces that were trying to keep television, to hold it back, to keep it from telling the full story of people's lives. And you document that really well. You know, uh, it's not academic, but you have footnotes. So it gives the readers, you know, a feeling of, uh, you know, um, I guess security, you know, like that, that they're, they're, you did your research. Um, I've, I did not know that, uh, that uh, Beverly, I, or I forgot. I thought Beverly in, in uh, All in the Family was just a, a one-off, just one episode. But but the uh, but that uh, character was in three episodes. Yeah, Beverly's an amazing example, and she's a great character. Uh, so All in the Family, you know, for folks who aren't familiar, is a groundbreaking show, early 1970s, um, about a about a family and a generational conflict. You've got the parents who are very traditional; they long for the olden days. And the kids uh, who are more progressive, and you see this clash between them that was very much based on Norman Lear and his his own father. Anyway, so early in the series run, they have an episode about a gay, what Archie believes he, basically, basically the dad believes he can detect gay people. He knows what gay people are like, um, at, although they never say the word gay. They use a lot of other words that start with F, but they never say gay. Uh, and then eventually in season, I think five, uh, they meet a character who is um, kind of, uh, there's some flexibility in how you can read Beverly. Um, right. Norman Lear, I was fortunate enough to be able to interview him for the book, and he said that they thought of that character as a drag performer. Um, but you could also read the character as trans, and you could read the character as existing in a, or non-binary, uh, or all of those. Uh, and they may exist in a category that uh, language simply did not capture in the 1970s. Um, because, you know, it was a time when terminology was very, um, still very up in the air, as it is today. It's organic. Yeah, I, I got trans from that character, but I'm, you know, I'm uh, from the performance. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's totally fair. And I think that that is a, a very valid way of reading the character. Um, Norman said that um, what they did is they just thought of that character as the performer. Uh, it was a person named Don McLean, who was a comedian in San Francisco. Don didn't even refer to himself as a drag queen. He said that he was a comedian and that he wore women's clothes. Um, but he played a character that he called Laurie Shannon. Norman happened to catch him at Finocchio's uh, in San Francisco and hired him to play Lori, uh, hired him to play Beverly LaSalle on All in the Family. And it was going to be a one-off. And they liked that character so much. They kept bringing her back for some beautiful episodes that humanize, you know, whatever category you want to assign them. I, I, I think it is fair to call them in today's terminology queer. Um, really humanizes the character. It makes them very... Um, very much a part of the family of all in the family. Edith says to me, "You're like a sister." Well, like a brother. Well, all of it rolled into one. It's lovely. <laughs> it was yeah, very sweet. Yeah, and uh, so unfortunately that uh, well, I, I guess uh, you could say it's you know killing our own kind of you know that you can make that com complaint. But by the end of the, the third episode, 
uh, as sad as it is, there are some valid, you know, that uh, they make it clear that this, well, I shouldn't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but the character uh, is, you know, meets a sad ending, which is, you know, not what you would see on a sitcom normally. Um, anyway, is there one show that in this bunch, uh, uh, threw it out, you mentioned dinosaurs, I never watched dinosaurs. Uh, so I have a feeling that, that that's close to your heart, because I wouldn't expect to see it in here. Um, it is. Like, I wouldn't expect to see the fly in, in Kyle's book, necessarily. But uh, so uh, do you have one show that you're particularly fond of? Gosh, well, I, you know, I love I love dinosaurs for just the strangeness of it. And they do have an episode that is allegorical about queer stuff, although I think it could have been a bit bolder. But then again, you know, it's, that's 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 the lament of just about every show. Like you could have gone a little further anyway. Um, yeah, I have to say that one. I mean, I love them all for various different reasons. I've been on a real uh, lately. This There's nothing queer. Actually, I take that back. I think you have to stretch further to find the queerness in My Mother, the Car, a show that I've really been obsessed with lately. But uh, I've really been enjoying a rewatch of My Mother, the Car, not because I enjoy the show, but I love the fact of its existence. Well, that's um, <laughs> funny. Well, that says a lot right there, not because you love the show, but just the fact that it existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know you love. Yeah, yeah. You you very interestingly said that a lot of '60s shows were about deception, mm. and. Uh, you know, which is, that's really interesting there. And and, uh, and uh, Travell, you know, uh, probably could say the same thing about a lot of the, uh, the, f the films that they covered early on uh, and or throughout our history in some ways. Uh, and uh, so it, I, I'm going to throw it to uh, each of you, starting with Travell, if, if not to put you on the spot, but uh, do you have a question for either Kyle or Matt? Sure, I have a question for both of you. Um, what is something that didn't make the cut? Something oh. that's not in the book that you wished or hoped for, but for various reasons uh, did not make it? Um, I'll go. I was really excited to, I, I really wanted to write about um, Short Bus, the John Cameron Mitchell film. Um, which uh, is about this, uh, it's about a, a bunch of people's interlocking lives in New York, um, but sort of framed around this uh, artsy queer sex party um, that is apparently based on real sex parties that John Cameron Mitchell and his downtown coterie would go to. Um, and I really admired its vision of a kind of mini queer utopia or um, uh, what could be imagined as such in, you know, someone's loft um, and that people could find pleasure and safety and community in those spaces. Um, but because of the limited space and I didn't want to have like too many overlapping directors, there are a couple of directors have, that have more than one film in the book. Um, and uh, I didn't want to have too much of that. I want to have as uh, inclusive and, and uh, as much of a vari variety as possible. So that one ended up getting cut because I already had Hedwig and the Angry Inch in there, so. Gotcha. Interesting. That's a great question, Travell. Uh, Matt, uh, do you have an answer for Travell? I would have loved to include, uh, have included more about Jim Neighbors, uh, who is on uh, The Andy Griffith Show and Jim Neighbors, uh, and, uh, Gomer Pyle uh, and variety of shows. Um, just a, a remarkable guy with an incredible life and a real sweetheart, just the loveliest man, um, really entwined in the um, mid-century closet, this is Hollywood's mid-century closet, and the work that went into keeping those. There's just such a machine to keep people, to keep queer people hidden. And I think Jim is a great example of that and of people who were fortunate enough to survive, come out the other end and be able to uh, eventually by the end of his life be public, but just wasn't room sadly for for jim so uh maybe in, maybe in my next book it's uh, yeah he was luckier than raymond burr although raymond burr had a lovely career <laughs> um but boy did they put uh all, out all the stops to to keep him in the closet like you know uh tragedy after tragedy with ex-wives that might like one wife died another wife died but did they really exist um, <laughs> no <Dick Sargent laughs> did the same thing 
Yeah, that just, oh, oh, my ex-wife. Well, and, and nobody, nobody either, nobody thought to track them down or more likely all of those press people were, the press people themselves didn't exist and they were fabrications of the PR agents at the studios. Until the late sixties when articles started coming out that he had to do some serious uh, dancing at the time. Um, so uh, great question, Travell. Uh, how about Matt, do you have a question for Travell and for Kyle? I would love, this is maybe a little wonky, but I would love to hear about um, if you had in your research process a scavenger hunt for something that was particularly fun to search for. Mm -hmm. I, no, you go. I was just gonna say, I, to be quite honest, all of my scavenger hunts were not fun. I was very frustrated. Um, like I, and for me, it was, I think, a frustration out of like, why doesn't this exist? Like, why, why can't I get rights to photos of Ajita Wilson? Right? The fuck? What do you mean? Um, and it was like stuff like that, that, and I don't even have a lot of photos in the book, uh, but there were some images that I, I wanted to be there for like, you know, history sake. Um, um, but like just couldn't get access to 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 certain things. Um, and then beyond the image side of things, also just like information about someone like Ajita Wilson. Um, there isn't a lot of um there aren't any interviews with her. There are only people's um, there are very few, few, very few discussions about who she was, very little mention of her in the archive, you know, across the globe. Um, um, but one great mention in Jet Magazine, she was a Jet Beauty of, of the Week, uh, this Black trans woman as a Jet Beauty of the Week back in the day, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a really interesting piece of, of, of Black media history. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was like mainly frustrated by the, the task at hand, um, but was, you know, grateful to, to find what I could find. Uh, Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick question, though, Tra Travell? Mm -hmm. uh, in your research, did you find that uh, Black newspapers covered queer issues in any way? You know? Absolutely, actually. So I relied actually a lot on another book that you all should check out, Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Snorton, um, who is a fabulous um, Black trans man academic researcher who's dedicated a lot of his work to uncovering the narratives of Black trans people in history. Um, and it was it was his book as well as um, Monica Roberts' blog, Trans Grio, that were like early access points for me before writing the book um, to realizing the ways in which trans people have been documented by the Black press. Um, now, obviously, there are complications and, you know, various issues therein, but they were very helpful. It was very wonderful to go back and see how Ebony Magazine covered this Black trans man, right? Or how um, uh, uh, Jet Magazine or the Afro-American, you know, which is a, a historical Black newspaper. Um, and, and so that was very, like, useful for me um, as someone who like, you know, cares about the Black press particular to know that even though there were some issues in the coverage <laughs> um, that, you know, that, we, you know, we were, we were represented because, right, there's a broader narrative that we as trans people just dropped onto the face of the earth with Laverne Cox and Orange is the New Black, right? <laughs> but to be able to go back to the 50s and see an article, right, in the Afro-American about this Black trans woman is like you know it, it, it's proof right that we've that we've been here a, a lot longer um if not for always right uh great thank you uh kyle uh yeah do, do you have a uh did you ha uh, go on a uh, on a dig for something that came up uh, empty um not empty but there were two things that i had a harder time finding one of them was farewell my concubine uh, which is a film by Cheng Gaike, um, which came out in 1994, I believe. Um, and it's, it's the sweeping historical epic. And it just, it's out of print in the United States. And I have to find it through alternative means, if you will. Um, that's odd, because that's such a well-known film. 
uh, it's been out of print in the United States for two decades at this point. Um, and there, and then there was My Hustler, um, the Chuck Ween, Andy Warhol film. Um, and it wasn't that, like there are versions of it that exist um, in pieces on the internet. Um, but the problem was that there are actually two versions of the film that exist. There's a 50 minute version and then there's a 70 minute version. I checked with my friend Liz Perchel, who's this really wonderful um, scholar and um, uh, archivist. Uh, she focuses primarily on the golden age of gay porn and she runs the podcast and Instagram Ask Anybody and, and also made the um, collage essay film of the same name. And I asked her um, what the deal was because I wasn't sure which one I should be watching and should be included in the book just so that everyone has like the correct information. And apparently what happened was that when it was originally released in uh, 1950, I believe, uh, it, there, it came out in the 15 minute version, which is just two reels. The first half of the film, which takes place from like on Fire Island and as uh, you, you viewed from like the porch of one of the Fire Island properties and you're, they're looking at um, the, the sex worker on the beach. And then the other half, which is inside the house in the bathroom with the, the sex worker and the other, the other guy talking about desire and whatnot. So there was, there was that version that was 50, 50 minutes that was released. And then when it became fairly popular, um, Chuck Ween was asked to add more stuff to it. And so taking a little bit of inspiration seemingly from like the popularity of Kenneth Anger, um, they added like, they added half of a reel that was just pop songs and like a model just walking around basically. And that version isn't really shown that much Is anymore. that from the original shoot? No, no, it was just something, it's something completely different. It was not part of the original <laughs> shoot. It was not part of the original film, but it was added just so that there would be a longer feature and that they, they could um, make more money and have the fact that it was using pop songs of the era uh, as a selling point. So that, that, that was um, a little hard to find. That, that, that sounds like it's better for like a, you know, video bar. Um, anyway, that, that's a very interesting film. It's sort of uh, triggering for some of us. Um, that, uh, yeah, that was sort of a sexy and interesting film. Um, oh my God. So, okay. Uh, now, Matt, uh, do you have questions? For Kyle and or a question for Kyle and Travell. That that was my question. It's Kyle's turn. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, Kyle. Do you have a question? I'm I'm getting thrown here. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, uh, I admired both of your work so much, and I was just curious through the writing process. Was there a particular section that was difficult to crack and to integrate into the whole um, of your project or difficult as far as like the emotional implications of going into a, a certain um, artifact and unpacking it? Travell? Um, I, uh, probably the whole damn book, um, <laughs> uh, by which I mean, because so every chapter opens up with some sort of personal story, personal reflection as it relates to you know, some of these images. Um, that is not the book that is out in the world is not the book that I pitched these people that they bought. Um, um, you, you know, go. I pitched, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, pitched, <laughs> I pitched something that I think was just like a lot more clinical in, in its approach of, of what it would be. And in the in the process of, of writing, I, uh, changed my mind or like it just it just felt necessary to like write more and more of of my relationship to some of these images and some of these conversations into the story um especially because i wanted i wanted to make sure that like it it pulsed with black assness um and so uh, it it the, the bits of like figuring out what parts of my own personal story that I wanted to, to share, right, as it relates to some of these images um, was <laughs> a process. Um, and then also making sure to like, you know, still do the history, 
still still cover you know that the stuff that I did sell them about for the book proposal um as well and so it was it was interesting time just trying to weave those stories um especially because I feel like you know the way my mind works is um unique perhaps um <laughs> and so you know opening you're a in the right chapter, crowd you know opening a chapter talking about um you know Tyler Perry as Medea and then also in that same chapter talking about you know vaudeville era you know depictions of you know men dressing up in in wigs but then also talking about how this connects to the IRL violence that we as black trans women and femmes are experiencing today in community and outside of community it's a lot um and so you know, I, I, you know, you read my book and you go on a, a, a long journey, a winding journey, because that's how my mind works. But putting it on the page, you know, to an editor who is not in my head uh, was interesting, to say the least. What I love about it is that you you see that process throughout the book, that, that it's it's exactly what you're thinking and 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 where you are in your own life at certain points and and where, you know, these depictions are. Um so uh, and so and yeah, Kyle. Uh, Matt. What do you say to Matt? You or... flipped it again. <laughs> so <laughs> to answer Kyle's question, uh, <laughs> difficult a difficult part to unpack was uh, so I have a chapter on friends, uh, which was um, challenging because uh, it's difficult not to roll one's eyes at a lot of the humor on that show, but also it was such an important sitcom. How could I not mention it? Uh, but boy, it, it, in some ways, uh, sure. it feels like a bit of a regression in terms of how daring television could be and how forward thinking it could be, which is surprising, particularly considering the creators. Uh, but also, it had a lesbian wedding and um, it didn't didn't do a terrible job uh, showing uh, co-parenting and parenting by by two women. So. Um, for all of the problems with the show, uh, it also it was able to use its its profile to give some visibility to characters who might um, not otherwise have appeared on television at that time. Uh, but, uh, and I think it also foreshadows how much better TV was about to get. I'm a certified friends apologist, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, it's very nice that Marta Kaufman in particular has spoken a lot about uh, her regrets and things that she would do differently. So uh, it's wonderful that they have Acknowledge well, at least she has acknowledged what she would do differently. Right, but there there were so many um, there were so many issues with that show in retrospect, or even at the time. I'm like, you know, it it, it there were so many other shows that uh, that didn't, you know, not one person of color in the cast, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, but because of its popularity, you know, we remember that, you know, but Cheers, the same thing. Um, and uh, it's just so odd that uh, the creators just wouldn't look around and notice that. It's just so odd to me to this day. Yeah, uh, white people yeah. being myopic? <laughs> I'm shocked. Well, yeah, yeah it's uh, writers that live in Brentwood. What what you can, can you say? Um, so now uh, Don mentions here, uh, Chandler's tra uh, trans dad, Ugg. That is a particularly regrettable uh, misstep by that show. And that's one of those things that Marta has said. Um, I'm paraphrasing. She said that they just didn't know any better and that they didn't realize that what they were doing was uh, offensive. And, um, and, and, and Kathleen Turner, who played the character, said that she wouldn't have taken the role today. And on one hand, it's very nice that they've realized that this wasn't great. Uh, on the other hand, at the time, you could have asked, GLAD existed and trans people existed and they could have told their stories very nicely. And there's no reason, um, and in particular, um, California Adams was doing a lot of co consulting at the time. So um, I, I think we didn't know is a right. real, a, an excuse of an excuse. It's across the board. It's network executives. Who knows? Uh, okay, so let's open it up to uh, some of our members who have questions. They can just, uh, you don't have to put it in chat. You can just say, hey, and um, take yourself off of mute, of course, first. Don't forget to take yourself off of mute. And um, Clarkisha, maybe you have a question. 
Yes, this is for Travelle. Hi, Travelle. First of all, I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I saw the email with your name in it and I'm like, I put in my calendar. I was like, I'm gonna come. All right, I'm gonna come. <laughs> so um, my question, obviously my question is for you. Um, audiobooks. Um, I was following your Instagram post, like kind of journey, like following your journey about recording the audiobook. And I kind of wanted to ask you how you felt about that. Because I also did my own because I wanted people to hear like the text in my voice as well so I just wanted to you know hear more about your thoughts on it because it was a very interesting <laughs> process I know for me yes I should Make say sure that Parkisha has a book out too I was just about to do it absolutely <laughs> I was just about to say y'all better check out fat on fat off okay what is it a is it a bad bitch manifesto yeah big oh, bitch manifesto. manifesto but yes <laughs> a big bitch manifesto uh check out Parkisha's book came out a couple months ago now? Yeah, March 7th, yeah. March 7th. And, and we did a previous Gallica Authors Chat um, yeah, that you could find on our YouTube channel along with this one after we- Period. Passed. Plug, 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 plug. <laughs> um, you know, the audiobook experience was interesting because I have, I've always said that I feel like I write with like a particular rhythm. Um, like I'm the type of writer who like, if the first sentence isn't good, I can't move to the second sentence. I will stare at that page, okay, <laughs> for three hours until I get that one sentence correct before I can move on. Um, and so another reason that I, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do my audiobook is because, you know, there's a lot of run-on sentences in, in my thing um, as perceived by other people. They look at me like, oh, that's a run-on sentence. Well, perhaps it is, but the way I say it, you know, it sounds complete and whole, you know, in that particular thought. Um, and so it was exciting to be able to, you know, be able to just take what I had written on the page in my particular voice and then also like give it to folks with that voice. Um, but it was, it was as somebody who talks all day already for a living, um, to then do that. And then I did eight hour, two eight hour, three eight hour recordings uh at night started like four until 11 um to do my because that's the only time I had Ugh. um it was it was a lot on on the on the vocal box um and I talk a lot for a living already um <laughs> but I I did enjoy it it was it was a lot of fun um to kind of just have that experience thank cool. you Markeisha uh how about Brian do you have a question for our our guests I do, I do. My first question is, in order to support you the best, where can we buy your books? Where would you like us to purchase your books? That's a terrible and, question. <laughs> and then I'd like to know about the a little about the publishing process, like because there are so I mean the questions are actually tied together. There are so many ways to purchase books these days. There are so many ways to publish books. And so I would, I know that's double question, but I'd love to hear whoever would like to answer either of those questions. Well, well, how about this? Uh, how about the authors put in the chat uh, information and links if they can uh, right. that members can cut, cut and paste or screenshot, screenshot. Yeah. I would just throw out there, I would love if you purchased my book from a black owned or trans owned bookstore. Uh, you know, local bookstores are important and they need that type of support. You can go to Amazon too, I guess. Um, but you know, if you, <laughs> bookshop.org is a great website that supports independent booksellers. Um, and so consider that, um, but yeah, you could get it from wherever. <laughs> That yeah, um, it's important to support, uh, just like what you said, just like what you said. Uh, uh, so, okay, uh, Marin has a question, but uh, we'd like to let's see, Brian, uh, what we, about the publishing uh, process, get, getting into a publisher? Any sort of quick tips on that process from the authors? Gosh, this is um, gonna. This this sounds like a lot of work because it is. But um, I would say that uh, the state of the industry being what it is, having a built-in audience from work one has done on the internet previous to proposing a book is very helpful. Um, I'm going through the process of doing a, a book proposal right now, and uh, a lot. One of the big questions is why you? Why why are you the person to write this? And being able to say like people already know me for this is helpful. 
and you built up your YouTube channel. And so you're a, a sort of a TV historian, uh, history authority now that has fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, do you have a thought? I think my experience was uh, a little different than both Matt and Travell's in that I was approached to write the a queer film guide by the Australian publisher Smith Street Books. Um, I was recommended by uh, another writer who had worked with them previously. And um, I feel incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity, um, but I recognize that my experience uh, was a little bit different and I didn't have to write a proposal. But I am working on a proposal now with my editor about a, a new thing. Um, and by working on, I mean uh, continually emailing her and saying, yes, I will get you that essay in a couple of weeks once this all settles down. And I just do that for several weeks at a time. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I um, understand that my experience is a little different, but it's, um, I think, important to have a community around you who is supportive of your work, sort of regardless of what process that you're going through. Um, because the most satisfying thing that has uh, that's that's been that I've experienced through that this process is just uh, having a um, loved ones be supportive of it. Um, and, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. In, in all of your acknowledgement yeah. pages, you know, Matt, uh, you know, it's it's you know people that it, it was nice to hear that you had friends read stuff and say, well, change this or add this or whatever. It's it's uh, that's nice to know. It takes a village. Um, and, Can I just uh, add really quickly, John? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, well, I also had people read it, uh, read my book, uh, because there were very few trans people involved uh, in, in my book, and I did not like that. So I had some trans people in community um, read my book for, you know, just, you know, get me together if I need to get, get together, you know? Um, um, name of my book, Dawn, is We See Each Other, A Black Trans Journey Through TV and Film. Um, and I will say for me, I was approached by my agent years ago at this point, and she was just like, I'm a fan of your, this is when I was working at the LA Times, I'm a fan of your writing, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, girl, what? Write a book? Who does that? Um, and then she was just like, well, if you ever think of something, you know, let me know, like, I would love to represent you. Fast forward three, four years, and then I was like, oh, I got a few ideas, girl, were you being serious? um and and she was and so we we met about it and then eventually i put a proposal together um that took some time <laughs> um, like kyle said um and then you know we you know sent, sent it out i will just note i got 12 no's before i got the one yes that that i did get um and, and that's that's crazy by the way i mean isn't it that's what yeah, i said it's crazy. Um, <laughs> But in, in the feedback that I got was um, that because uh, because Disclosure, the film um, existed, um, I participated in Disclosure um, as one of the, the voices on screen, but they said because Disclosure existed, they weren't sure what a future life for the book idea could look like. Um, and then that they weren't sure what my book would sit alongside on the shelf. Oh. Um, and so oh. all of those people were like, oh, we like Travel's voice. Like if Travel wants to do a memoir, we'll take it. Oh. Um, but again, I pitched a very clinical, you know, approach to the witch call it that if they had, if they had taken the gamble, they would have got part memoir anyway, but they didn't see the vision. Okay. So that's their problem. But I say that to say I got 12 rejections um, from the 17 people that we sent it out to, and it was the 13th um um response that we got which was a meeting um that led to the book being sold um so yeah you know there are i will say that there are small publishers out there uh that that publish you know uh queer titles uh subject matter that might not you know if if they like what you, you know you're writing and uh you have a unique idea they might not you know, it might be an easier process than you think, you know, but but that doesn't mean you're going to be raking in the, the moolah necessarily. And I don't know in publishing if anybody really rakes in the moolah unless you're, uh, you know, uh, you write, uh, you know, mystery novels and uh, sci-fi things. Anyway, okay, uh, uh, or fantasy. Marin, what's your question? 
Um, I'm so sorry to Buddy, and I have to go into my other job now. So I just have a pretty simple question. Hopefully, it's simple. Maybe not um, for for Travel. And that is um, amongst your many identities, where do you put yourself generationally, and how does your age or your generation affect the way you view these cultural texts? Oh, oh love that. Question. Um, I am 31 years old, but I also tell people that I'm emotionally 72. Um, so you need to know that because I am technically young and a millennial, but a lot of my thinking, you know, might be a little bit more seasoned than I am. Um, and so I think what it what ends up happening, right, is we end up having a lot of these images of of transness or gender expansiveness in culture from from moments of yesteryear. Um, and oftentimes we see them through today's lenses like negatively or we want to do away with them. Um, for me, I'm more interested in just like wrestling with them, not trying to say that something should not be regarded or should not be watched or should not be consumed today, but let's talk about, you know, what's happening on screen, what it means, what it meant in culture at that time, what it means in culture today, um, because I think that, that that allows us to, like, just treat art with the care and the rigor that it deserves, um, and so that's how I kind of think of like the, the generation question um, in, in my particular work. Thank Kyle? you so much, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Travel. Thank you. And Kyle and, and Matt, do you, do you have a quick take on that? Not that we need to know your age in particular. I mean, you know, <laughs> generation. Travel is emotionally 72. My back pain says I'm also 72, so I get that. Um, and I, I completely agree. I mean, I think what's been um, really edifying, to use John's word, um, is being able to um, engage and wrestle with these um, artifacts, regardless of where, what time they are from, and, and trying to contextualize them within their um, original time of release and the culture that um, allowed them to be created in the first place, and also reckon with um, how that may or may not be in line with how we think about or discuss desire and identity and sexuality and queerness today. And that's what I find that to be like incredibly intellectually and emotionally um, uh, satisfying. And um, I, I, being able to share these things with other people is what uh, has kept me writing for so long. Um, getting into conversations and debates about um, how we uh, engage and how we talk about the, the images that we see on screen that are uh, sensibly of us or or claim to be um, and how those um, how those images are, are crafted from hopefully an authentic or, or sincere point of view so and how they regress and, and then come you know like and then prog progress over time mm -hmm. like the ups and downs of you know yeah, I think it's to more the 60s to the 70s to the 80s, you know, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's more um, exciting and um, intellectually uh, um, satisfying, I guess, to be able to take something um, holistically and, and really think about uh, what it means, what its implications are, what what about it works or doesn't work. Um, and what about me? Sorry, oh. uh, we're going to wrap this up in, in like at, at one Sorry. thirty. So that I've, no, 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 you're okay. <laughs> we, uh, but uh, I mean, I, this could go on forever. Um, now, Matt, do you do you have a, 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 a what's your age and social security number? So uh, I, I mean, I don't mind saying that I'm forty two, and so I'm kind of floating between Gen X and um, millennial, but. Um, I'm also culturally, I'm sort of the Billy Pilgrim and that all my cultural references are out of time and <laughs> floating around between things uh, and trying to make them, I mean, the real challenge, like I was saying, the, the, the challenge is making things that feel old, seem relevant to people who might find that off-putting. I'm watching, I'm doing a rewatch of, I not a rewatch, I'm watching finally for the first time, I Claudius, the, the BBC. Oh yeah, yes. so God. Wow, wow, it's fantastic. And yes. like we finished episode two last night and I turned to my partner and I'm like, I like this better than Game of Thrones. This is a better Game of Thrones than Game of Thrones. Um, so now I like, I guess my my evangelism now is like to convince people like, well, if you like 
House of the Dragon or whatever, Whaley get a load of <laughs> of Derek Jacobi and you know that was PBS in, in the seventies, and that was BBC. really that was a, a a hit. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder, you know, my partner was saying, I wonder if this was a hit because you know, post Stonewall, um, people were really interested in. Um, how exposing how fallible their rulers were. So I don't know. I think that's a, a really interesting way of connecting it to the, I, you know, kind of my brand connecting it to the um, the entertainment to the uh, I don't know sublimated anxieties of the time. Well, I, I want to be Phillips part of your brand. Everyone's Excellent. amazing Kyle? in that. Yeah. Kyle, you said something. I'm sorry. Oh, I said Sean Phillips slays in that show. Good. Okay, I Claudius. Uh, maybe it's available on YouTube. I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you got to get an Acorn subscription, whatever that oh, is. Uh, oh. or, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, just uh, uh, as we uh, uh, have our last thoughts here, do Lindsay or and or Valerie have a question for our guests? Don has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Don. Oh, Don. I asked a question in a chat, but I didn't get to speak, so I'll just make it quick. Thank you so much. It is always an honor to be in your presence, Travel and Matt and Kyle. I'm new to you, but thank you so much for sharing uh, your book with us. Um, my question is for Matt. Matt, I was just at Outright, and I got to talk one-on-one -on, -one on the red carpet with Celia Rose Gooding, who is the first Black queer person to play Lieutenant Uhura in our beloved Star Trek franchise. And I am a huge fan of Star Trek, as John would know if he looked at my ballots. Um, but what I am really excited about is that not just Star Trek Discovery, but now Star Trek Strange New Worlds has three out queer actors, and at least one of them is playing a queer character, a bisexual. So my question to you, Matt, is do you think that um, that Star Trek and other sci-fi franchises are helping with the uh, our movement, or is it? Um, are, are you sad that it's not as far as it should be? Because I, I I think that Star Trek Discovery gets a lot of criticism from outside the LGBT community of being too queer. Yeah, you know, I I mean, it's both. I, I'm very happy with the progress that Star Trek is making. Um, often that franchise, you know, they're ahead of the, the curve on. Um, the racial diversity of the enterprise uh, in the 60s. But boy, oh boy, sometimes you just gotta drag him kicking and screaming to something queer. And so I'm glad that they're getting there now and that they took some baby steps with like DS9, for example, in the 90s. Um, but I think absolutely sci-fi has a lot of potential to push the boundaries there. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as too queer. Um, you know, I won't be satisfied until we get a Star Trek that's that's all queer. You know, yeah. I, I want to see zero heterosexuals on the end. Well, Picard of ended with Picard ended with a um, bisexual captain and a queer first officer. So who are in a relationship? So let's hope maybe there's a sequel. Um, and I can only um, lament that my own experience in trying to get a book published twelve years ago was sabotaged by someone at Harper Collins. Hit me up privately if you want to hear the whole story. It's awful. But the person Did broke you? an NDA and leaked it to the, the tabloids. Okay. So all the publishers who were interested in my memoir said, it's in the papers. Who cares now? Oh, you can start over. Starting yes. over. Um, OK, thank you, Don. Valerie or uh, 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 let's see, Valerie or Lindsay, do you have a question? I can go if it's OK. Um, so we talked about this a little bit with friends, but um, I was interested, it seems like the 21st century narrative about representation on screen um, is that it's like a straight line upward, there's always progress, um, but I think it's it's increasingly obvious that um, that's a very oversimplified um, narrative of constant progress um, in representation. Um, so I was wondering if any of you had um, examples in your research of having to grapple with realizing that um, progress isn't as linear as you maybe imagined or there was something older that was better at dealing with queer history or vice versa, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, in just researching television history, uh, there's a constant pendulum swing back and forth um, of a little bit of representation and then a backlash, a little bit and then a backlash. And uh, what you, 
what I believe is the most effective, the times that have been the most effective are when there are three groups all working together. Well, maybe not working together, but three groups working at the same time. One is the insiders in the industry who are willing to take a chance and put something queer on the air. The other group that you need are the collaborators, which is uh, activists who will work with the industry and have meetings and wear bow tie, or wear, wear neckties and dress well, and they're not too scary for the executives. And you also need the rowdy outside guerrilla activists who will throw a brick and take over an office and scream and shout and scare the um, people who have their hands on positions of power. And I think over the last 20 years, we've had a really nice trajectory of things getting better and better and better. And we've lost the we've lost the ability to spook the horses. And so I think what is needed right now is to um, a return to, or a more attention to queer nation tactics and act up tactics to uh, really, um, you know, shake things up because our victories are not permanent. We will not, we do not permanently win anything. We constantly have to defend it. You could say that across the board with uh, everything that's happening right now, um, democracy, et cetera. Um, okay, how about, uh, that's, uh, thank you, Matt. How about uh, Lindsay? Just, you wanna bring it on home? Um, sure, unless someone, unless Travell or Kyle wanted to also answer that question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sure. No, I just, I came here to hear you talk, but thank you. Um, uh, I have sort of a tangentially related question, which is in terms of the more recent and maybe, you know, less gratifying examples of queer media that we've seen, like it's one thing to look at older stuff and say like, through a modern lens, this is problematic, but it was really resonant and meaningful at the time. And it's another thing to look at something that came out this year and say like, that was awful actually, <laughs> but also in like an environment where, we need the collaboration of the people inside these studios to keep having these things exist at all. Is it hard as entertainment critics and people who are writing about queer media to find the balance of saying like, this actually sucked, but please don't stop making queer movies and television because this was so bad. And I'm saying that I promise it's still like, there's a capitalist incentive. Like, how do you navigate that? Uh, uh, Travel? I, oh, uh, Kyle, sure. Oh, I am a little bit cynical i although i would never argue for less representation i am very seldom looking for um versions of sincere or authentic or complicated versions of a queer life that is uh, approximate to things that i've experienced or that friends and loved ones have experienced from studio from big studios i, I that is just not where i look um and i appreciate <clears throat> and value any um, progress that is that is made in, in those spaces. But the things that I find most interesting um, and uh, most valuable are coming from more independent avenues and things that um, need that visibility in the first place, That things that don't necessarily have the resources or the apparatuses to have like huge mainstream releases. And I think that's where and not to say that like independent filmmaking doesn't have its own systematic issues, <clears throat> but I think because you're working on tighter budgets and you're working on a smaller scale, um, there are circumstances in which people are, will simply not will be worried about like trying to please a huge, wide, white, straight, cis audience. Like they're focused on um, maintaining like the, uh, hopefully the um, purity of the story or the ideas that are at hand um, with an awareness of the people who want to look for it are going to find it. That's great. Uh, Travell, did you have a thought there? Um, I completely agree with all of that. I would just add that, you know, I am all, while not looking to, you know, mainstream Hollywood for, um, in the big studios for, you know, that, you know, promised land of, of representation. Um, I do want, you know, queer and trans creatives to have those budgets, to have those resources, to have access to, you know, whatever that is. Um, because I want, I, I want to see, you know, the Black trans imagination on IMAX 
you know, like I, I that's what that's what I I want to see while also seeing it on the small screen and you know the the mom and pop you know independent um type fair um, especially because that's where we're seeing a lot of the more I think transgressive um images of queer and trans people on screen and so and so we need we need all of it um but I think what what Kyle mentioned is is definitely right we we can't there's a lot more work to be done for the, the, the studios to, um, to recognize the ways in which our stories can also be commercial capitalistic successes. <laughs> um, um, not to say that we all want to, you know, continue perpetuating and living under this particular system. How yeah, else? Rainbow capitalism. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure it works for us too, okay? <laughs> While we have it. 